Today, we will get to know more about Element 79, Nusa Nickel, Golden Rapture Mining, Tugvan Ventures, and Pulsar Helium. To begin with, let's start with Element 79, a public gold and silver exploration company that I'm pretty sure you guys already heard about. James Torek, CEO of the company, is joining us to discuss the company's potential. James, welcome. Thank you very much, Mark. And just before we start, uh, there is the chat function on the side. Uh, let us know where you guys are from, you know, the city, province, country. It's always great to know where people are located. And aside, you guys have the Q&A function. Any type of questions you might have prepared beforehand, the call or a point you would like to have uh, during the call for a deeper explanation, drop it there and we will come back once James is done with the pre presentation. So now I'm going to turn off my camera and pass it to uh, over to yourself, James, for introducing yourself and the company. Thank you, thank you very much, Mark. Um, well, here we are, Element 79 Gold Corp. Uh, happy to make a presentation and uh, introduce you to what we're up to as well as where we're going. Uh, as a cautionary note, as is custom, uh, we are going to be making forward-looking statements. Uh, so kind of be prepared for that. Consider yourself noticed or on notice. Element 79, Gold Corp uh, is trying to bring a little bit of innovation to the junior mining model. And what we mean by that is that it, uh, if you look at the standard mining uh, business, it's very difficult to run any business without cash flow. Our focus was to start out a company that had near term cash flow generation prospects. And the way we've done that is that we've acquired a project in Peru that was a past producing mine. We did that for two reasons. Number one was specifically that uh, the best place to find a mine is where there used to be one, as well as separately, um, that uh, you can't beat grade. And this was a very high grade mine during its uh, last era of commercial production. In addition to that, we're also, uh, we do have a couple uh, projects that will bring some opportunities for uh, some exploration growth, uh, which we'll see unlock uh, starting next year. And the biggest thing uh, that I really have a, uh, an I guess a main focus on and a, an open heart towards is that uh, the reality is that every mining project really is two projects. And uh, we have a, a very community focused mentality about the way that we approach uh, this mining project in terms of turning the mine back on and uh, having a very positive impact inside the communities that we do work in. So uh, as I've just been through, uh, we are focused on uh, basically <laughs> working in favorable mining jurisdictions where um, they are open for business, so to speak. Uh, it's going to be easier to uh, everything from political aspects um, as well as infrastructure aspects, as well as local communities that are open towards mining. Um, we do have a community first focus when it comes to um, working on our mine and developing out uh, first and foremost, our relationship inside the community uh, understanding what it is they are looking for uh, just as much as we are looking for uh, turning the mine back on. Now, uh, more than anything, uh, just to go back to where this mine is, uh, Arequipa, Peru. Okay, Lucero was a past producing mine. It is currently permitted for 350 tons, of day, uh, tons per day of ore extraction. And in its past era, the reason why this is so attractive to us, in the past era of commercial production, um, which ranged from 1989 to 2005, this mine was producing at uh, approximately 150 tons per day. And it was producing on average 19 grams per ton of gold equivalency and yielded between 40 to 50,000 ounces of gold equivalency per year. So again, you can't beat grade and the best place to find a mine is where there used to be one. We are waiting uh, for in the next couple of months uh, for our surface rights contract to be completed, uh, meaning that the community gives us the right and the ability to explore and extract from the project, uh, i.e. getting the surface rights to the mine that dovetails with our federal level or extraction permit. And it's uh, very exciting for us to start work, which will include both an underground and surface level drill program that will fill into a drilling program. Um, uh, to give us a resource as well as uh, form a mine plan and begin commercial ore extraction. We've talked about Lucero enough. It is an active mine. There are 74 veins on surface. All of the past production and current artisanal production comes from 
literally seven of them. So we're less than 10% into this entire project because there are 74 veins at surface. In addition to that, we do have two assets in Nevada, which are uh, great in terms of general closeology to some uh, other major producing mines. And it's up to us to unlock those in the uh, midterm. More important than the project, we have an amazing executive team. Our team is based on a global level, um, or a team with global level experience, I'm sorry. Uh, men and women that have worked around the planet on major mining projects and understand the junior capital markets very well. Uh, we do have uh, a strong moral compass in terms of uh, ethically and sustainably developing our projects. And um, we're here again as a group uh, using our experience to turn on uh, past producing mine. Uh, it's a very exciting prospect to be using the right people with the right project and in a sustainable manner, turning a mine back on in the very near term. My background, uh, just to give you an idea of who we are, my background comes from corporate finance. Uh, I started my career in uh, commercial banking and then worked inside of a mezzanine debt fund working on project finance. Uh, basically 25 years of my career has been focused on uh, helping uh, projects get up and running. Uh, it's been a fantastic uh, foundation for that and I'm a very quick learner when it comes to uh, natural resource projects. I'm based in Calgary, Alberta. So uh, for me to understand the natural resource sector, whether uh, oil and gas, uh, farming <laughs> and or uh, mining has always been in uh, both my family's blood just as much as my own blood uh, and, and work experience. Uh, our CFO, Tammy Gillis, uh, fantastic in terms of her experience, in terms of helping junior mining companies, uh, basically uh, all of the forms of compliance and uh, financial controls that are required for that, free audit preparation, et cetera. Um, Kim Kirkland, a uh, bit of a racehorse that we've hooked up to our apple cart. Uh, Kim spent uh, 21 years working inside Peru uh, for two major projects, uh, most notably Antamina, uh, which is a large copper project uh, in uh, pretty close to Lima and uh, global scale. It's a tech joint venture, as well as uh, he spent nine years working at the Las Bambas mine, uh, which is an MMG in China MinMet joint venture. Um, when he was there as a regional operations manager, Kim um, was the uh, basically in charge of all the production nodes and feeding um, Peru's largest copper mine of its day. And... Uh, <laughs> very happy to bring that experience to something as uh, small scale as what we're doing. Um, it's nothing but scale. And uh, he has the experience in terms of an amazing network of people down there in Peru. Uh, he does speak the language just like I do. And uh, if nothing else, he understands how to turn on a mine, which is a fantastic asset. Um, another teammate that we uh, are, are very proud to have on our team is uh, Mr. Tony Maragakis. He works as a director for us. Uh, Tony was the original CEO of uh, the company that we acquired to acquire this um, uh, Peruvian asset. And he is a uh, civil engineer focused on uh, mining development specifically. Uh, started his career at Barrick, uh, then moved over to uh, Coke Industries, Freeport McMoran, El Dorado, where he built uh, the Scuris mine over an eight year period um, over in uh, Turkey and Greece. And uh, then he had formed a, a geological consultancy with about 50 people working there um, hoping or helping with um, all the background controls of mining companies. Um, one of the biggest successes uh, that you had seen is that uh, when he walked into Skeena Resources with his consultancy, um, they basically brought a lot of the project controls to the background and he had helped it from a $20 million market cap reach over a billion dollar market cap in terms of the successes seen over a five-year window. And uh, that team is doing it again, not just behind the scenes here, but also at uh, West Red Lake Gold. Speaking of West Red Lake Gold, uh, one of our special strategic advisors is Mr. Shane Williams. Um, again, he was originally tied to the uh, group that we had acquired down in Peru and um, right now sits as a strategic advisor to us. Uh, and again, he was the COO at Skeena Resources during that same time as Tony. So you see a bit of a dynamic duo. Uh, they started at El Dorado together. Uh, they worked uh, together at uh, Skeena, building it into what it is today as well as uh, now they're ramping up uh, behind the scenes at West for Lake Gold. Amazing to have a team of uh, experience like this on our uh, our board and advisory board. Um, quickly, uh, Mr. Neil Pettigrew, he is our uh, QP, Master of Science in PGO, uh, very well, uh, or sorry, held in very high esteem with the Ontario uh, Geological Study 
as well as uh, he works with um, the company that uh, was formerly known as uh, Palladium One Resources. I believe it's called uh, GT Resources now as their um, uh, VP Exploration and uh, having him uh, work as a QP and uh, sign off on all of our uh, geological data as well as give us some fantastic ideas for exploration work. Uh, fantastic to have him as part of our team. Uh, Zara Kenji, again, financial controls and uh, helping with uh, all forms of corporate governance. Mr. George Tumur has had several exits in the uh, multi-hundred million dollar range in the mining industry uh, through his career. And Mr. Warren Levy has also in the natural resources sector across Latin America, uh, spent more than 23 years across Latin America, uh, building and developing um, with a socially conscious mentality, uh, pushing companies forward uh, towards success. He's had some major uh, significant exits in the space and he is here helping us, uh, helping guide us uh, towards further success at uh, what we're doing at Lucero and beyond. To give an idea of what our team has been able to achieve uh, since our IPO in 2021, uh, we did acquire a portfolio. It, we had grown it from um, originally uh, just one project to over 20, well, to up to 20, I should say. And then we've been divesting of that. So uh, in the, the mentality of buy low, sell high, um, we were able to acquire some projects at some really good values. And we've been divesting of those to help fund uh, both corporate operations as well as uh, in many cases, we're holding on to some shares of the uh, companies that we have been, uh, or the projects we've been selling. We hold on to shares in the companies that acquire them so that uh, that helps grow our balance sheet and we can use for non-dilutive uh, funding of our exploits in the future. One uh, significant sale that just closed last month at the start of last month was Maverick Springs. As a team, we had uh, acquired it, uh, reimagined it. it uh, when we purchased it, it had a, uh, 1.8 million ounce uh, resource, uh, historical resource in terms of gold equivalency. And um, it was only ever conceived as an underground mine. In that, um, we then reimagined it to bring up a 43101 uh, to modern standards. And uh, we reimagined it as a whittle pit. In doing so, we more than doubled the resource value, uh, which is a significant win. And unfortunately, at the time, uh, gold and silver weren't exactly uh, you know, as in favor as uh, much of the battery metals world. Um, so it was a little tough to find uh, development capital for it, but we did find a counterparty uh, in terms of being able to sell the asset. That sale just closed last month and we've uh, since cleaned up our balance sheet dramatically in terms of uh, paying off some debt and cleaning up accounts payable. And it left us with a small war chest in terms of working capital to move things forward. So uh, in terms of being able to prove that this team knows what it's doing and we've had some recent successes, there you go. Where we're looking uh, going forward in terms of uh, different growth levers, uh, number one, again, May 8th, we closed uh, Maverick Springs and significant cleaned up the balance sheet. Um, looking at what we're doing in Peru, um, we are looking at uh, number one, uh, completing our um, community relationship contract, which would, it's actually two separate contracts. One is for us to get a long-term uh, surface rights access uh, contract uh, fulfilled, number one. And by that completing, um, we also, in a sense of, uh, you know, one hand washing the other, we also grant the local mining association the ability to also continue its, um, it's a formalization process where they're able to continue producing the way they have been um, over the last 19 years, but in a formalized fashion. What that does is it actually aligns our interests, number one, so we're not uh, tripping over each other, number two, so we're sharing resources, um, you know, and working the mine more efficiently as we intend to ramp up. Um, but, uh, lastly, the major benefit of that, uh, in the immediate term for our revenue generation is that, uh, they would then be selling their product currently about uh, 70 to hundred tons of high grade ore per week. Uh, they would be selling that to us and we would be wholesaling that. So our first step into, uh, revenue generation this year is by virtue of that, uh, contract being completed. Um, are, again, as I described earlier, uh, what we intend to be doing is starting some bulk sampling this year and uh, moving towards uh, not only through a drill program to prove up a resource, uh, but that data will also help fill a uh, mine plan as well as PEA so we can start ramping up this year into next year um, with commercial production in a ramp up fashion. I call it crawling before we walk, before we run. And in doing so, uh, what I mean is that we're going to be uh, starting with bulk sampling and smaller uh, gross tonnage, and then moving up to 25, 50, 75, 100 tons per month, uh, trying to average out, uh, probably hitting a, a baseline of at least uh, 200 tons per day 
as we uh, grow over the next uh, 18 to 24 months. So um, ultimately, that's the, the simple uh, you know, target here. There are some other regional uh, M&A opportunities that I anticipate being able to release shortly here, but uh, contracts aren't signed, so I can't say too much. Recapping what Lucero is and the, the reason why we have uh, such a, a laser focus on this project is that specifically you can't beat grade and you uh, it's a past producing mine that's actually still in production uh, with the artisanal miners. And uh, number one, uh, first and foremost, uh, 19 grams per ton equivalent, uh, or sorry, I should say gold equivalent um, was the past producing rate. So 14 grams per ton of uh, gold and 373 grams per ton silver. That's significant in terms of being able to um, efficiently operate a small scale mine. Um, again, in its last uh, five years building up to uh, when it was shuttered and it was only shuttered because of economic concerns at the time, uh, it was costing the, the company producing there seven to $800 uh, per um, ounce in terms of their own sustaining cost and gold dipped below $700. So at the time, they just economically, it just didn't make sense for them to continue producing here. It does definitely at $2,000 gold, $2,000 plus dollar gold. Uh, but ending in 2005, it was producing approximately, on average, 40,000 ounces of gold equivalency per year at only 150 tons per day. Um, as you may have noted, my goal uh, or our team's goal is to uh, ramp up towards at least that, if not greater, minimum 200 tons per day over the next 18 to 24 months. We have been pulling some assays um, in terms of both. Um, we did a mapping program. Uh, there was a grab sample program as well as a more formal channel sampling program, which was completed towards the end of last year. And out of uh, over 500 samples uh, from the channel sampling program, um, we did, uh, again, just to highlight uh, where you can't be grade, we were playing uh, channel samples at 11.7 ounces or 374.4 grams per ton gold and 247 ounces or 7,904 grams. Uh, per ton of silver, which obviously validates why, number one, the artisanal miners have continued working here as well as where we're going um, in terms of uh, turning this back into a commercially producing mine in the near term. So uh, with that in mind, uh, that data will be used to form a, um, a it will be the, the uh, foundational data set for our drill program. We will start with underground drilling. And uh, from there, uh, probably at least one to 3,000 meters of underground drilling. And then separately, that will feed um, at least another two to 4,000 meters of surface level drilling to prove up a resource on uh, the main producing veins. So uh, very excited to get the drills turning this uh, later this summer uh, once we have our permits approved. Uh, an interesting factoid about uh, this is that when we acquired this asset, uh, we were under the impression that based on historical data that we were given, uh, there were only two and a half kilometers of total underground workings on this project. Again, there are 74 veins and all the past production has only come from seven of them. Uh, but again, we were under the impression there was only something like two and a half to three kilometers of total underground workings. Our recent mapping program proved that there was more like nine, eight to nine kilometers of total underground workings in those seven vein sets. Um, in addition to, that's only what we were able to um, actually get through during the time allotted. So uh, we firmly understand there's more there, but we just haven't been able to map it. Circling back on my uh, previous comments about um, our corporate focus on having a strong social relationship with the people that we, uh, I guess, work beside and work with inside the Chachas community, um, we feel it's uh, absolutely imperative that we have uh, both uh, high standards when it comes to environmental um, work and making sure that we uh, aren't making situations worse, but actually leaving them better uh, when it comes to the environmental work at a mine. Um, in terms of uh, working with the community, making sure um, that we have a positive impact uh, wherever we are working. And uh, to ensure that, number one, uh, over the last 18 months, we have employed community relations specialists that have gone out there uh, to the community on a monthly basis where we can't be there every single day. Um, they're there at least 15 to 20 days per month and uh, helping um, both understand uh, what the community needs, uh, naturalizing the concept of we are restarting this mine and socializing our own, um, uh, our own firm in that process. Uh, we were, uh, through this effort, uh, granted the ability to open up a 
uh, social uh, outreach office as of February of this year. So we do have a more permanent, uh, we'll call it, uh, you know, foot on the ground as well as shingle on the wall uh, for uh, general, you know, understanding and recognition and presence. Uh, but also through that, we've been employing a local, um, uh, sorry, a, <laughs> a local NGO. And uh, this is an Ade Kipa uh, group. So uh, from the same state where our mine is, uh, in terms of understanding, you know, everything from the uh, the mentality, politics, economics, uh, language, uh, speaking both Spanish and Quechua, um, we've employed them uh, to help us in terms of uh, not just uh, you know give to the community and give back to the community, but uh, help set the stage properly for uh, everybody's mentality in terms of uh, ramping up a uh, more formally producing mine, more so than the small scale uh, mining that we have been done. Uh, this uh, helps both with local education in terms of understanding um, everything that the, the Peruvian government needs uh, all remote communities to understand when it comes to um, politics, economics, uh, health, uh, social health. And uh, really, uh, there's some really neat programs that are uh, rolling out as well on top of just understanding um, how to improve oneself and uh, the community as a whole, but also really neat programs in terms of um, uh, teaching young entrepreneurs to understand uh, just the simple business cycle, understand, uh, you know, money better, understand, um, you know, how they can be helping themselves, but also helping their own community. Um, so having a more uh, positive impact in the short run, uh, as well as in the big picture long run, is what our intent is. Um, one quick comment I will make uh, about the two projects we have in um, Nevada, uh, both Clover and West Whistler. Um, I mentioned Closology before. Clover is about 16 kilometers away from the Hecla's past producing uh, Midas mine. Um, and West Whistler is uh, in proximity to um, the uh, I-80 Ruby Hill mine. Uh, both uh, early stage exploratory uh, projects in terms of being able to, um, you know, uh, work from existing data sets from past owners and uh, model out uh, both existing data as well as uh, form a drill plan off of those to hit uh, some more significant uh, drill holes. Uh, from an overall package of 20 projects as a whole, these are the two that we decided to keep. And uh, so therefore you will see us develop those uh, over time uh, starting next year. Quick comment about our uh, company in terms of the capital overview. Um, we did complete a um, share consolidation uh, 10 to 1 share consolidation that was complete between November and December of last year. We then, uh, we had about $10 million of debt outstanding on the company. Um, at that time, we took $5.76 million of that debt, uh, which we considered, you know, strategic and friendly debt. Uh, we did consolidate that. Um, so we went from 130 million shares down to about 13 million shares and then bolted back in uh, by converting that debt um, into shares um, about 57 and a half million uh, shares of total value that are held into uh, what we consider to be uh, very strategic uh, hands. And um, in addition to that uh, management and board, uh, sorry, that makes it about 58% of the overall cap table. Um, management and board hold about 16%. Um, we did a small, uh, two small equity raises in terms of um, making sure we still had some working capital to push the company forward uh, throughout the first half of the year. And uh, that makes it about six. Those new shareholders uh, make it about 6%. Um, the little dark green wedge is actually 2%. And that's uh, Condor Resources, our counterparty to uh, purchasing this asset. Uh, we have done some share swaps with them in terms of uh, having them as a uh, strategic and uh, I guess we could call them semi-institutional holder of uh, our uh, asset, uh, I should say our, our shares. And uh, ultimately, uh, again, clean balance sheet because number one of that uh, share cleanup, as well as number two, uh, through the sale of Maverick Springs, we've been able to uh, pay out additional debt uh, and accounts payable. Uh, a lot of the most significant ones are gone and um, have a, a far more healthy balance sheet from this point going forward. Um, given the fact that we are so close to um, cash flow, uh, I'm never going to say I'll never raise another dollar out in the market. Uh, that would be foolish running a public company. Uh, but I will say that uh, because we do have some solid uh, prospect of generating revenue in the near term, uh, in the next uh, nine to 12 months, that uh, it is a little bit more appealing to finding institutional capital um, like royalties, streams, or even capital debt 
uh, to develop out the project. So we are working with a number of sources uh, for the um, financing of both the drill program and getting us back into commercial production. And we expect to be releasing some information about that in uh, the coming months. Thank you very much for your time today. I do appreciate the opportunity to share our story. And uh, if you have any questions, by all means, I'm more than happy to answer any of them. Well, thanks a lot for this very detailed presentation, James. And as you just said, we actually got some questions coming here. And a few of them are actually about like some like financials. So the very first one is from Andrew Jones. And he's asking, when do you believe the first revenue may be generated by Element 79? I would argue, um, you know, first and foremost, uh, by the formalization of the contracts uh, that I had discussed, we're going to see between Q3 and Q4, some of the of this year, we're going to be seeing um, some revenues start trickling in from the uh, the wholesaling process of the ores from the artisanal miners. Um, separate from that, uh, once we finish the drilling program and uh, start getting to the bulk sampling, uh, we will start seeing further revenues. That'll be more like Q4 of this year. Um, Q1 of every year is always going to be a little bit slow because there is a natural rainy season um, that basically uh, between, let's call it middle of December to uh, middle of approximately uh, March, um, it literally prevents access uh, at this level of uh, mine development and infrastructure. So uh, Q1 will be slow, but uh, revenue will uh, start ramping up yet again in um, end of Q1 to Q2 of 25. Okay. Um, we got another question about uh, your flagship project, uh, the Maverick Springs, uh, the Max Maverick Springs property, sorry, mm -hmm. and about the sale. Uh, we got a question from Jeffrey, who's asking how much did Element 79 make out of mm -hmm. the sale, and if you guys mm -hmm. plan to sell the Sun Silver shares um, in the future. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, Maverick Springs was sold at a profit. Um, our all-in costs uh, after acquiring, working, and um, uh, I guess we'll say carrying costs overall was about three point three six million um, total. Okay, and we sold it for uh, basically four point four million Canadian dollars plus three and a half million shares of Sun Silver. Uh, the ASX ticker is SS one. And uh, they were priced at 20 cents uh, in conjunction with the IPO uh, last raise in conjunction with their own IPO, which was May 15th of this last year. Uh, per ASX rules, we do have a one year hold on those shares. So we're not able to sell them this year. But yes, in a strategic fashion over time, we will uh, be divesting of those shares um, in a strategic manner, obviously not to uh, shock there. Um, you know, overall uh, market, but at the same time, use those shares to help us fund our exploits in the future. Thank you. Now, now we have a pure financial question uh, about financing. Uh, financing and funding. Uh, it's from Keith uh, Goldsmith, and he's asking, what kind of funding are you looking at? Is it streaming or royalty? And there was the question about seeing the Sun Silver shares, mm -hmm. but you just answer to this question. <laughs> so please like answer to the first part of the question. Sure thing. Um, in my last couple slides there, I was mentioning um, that we are exploring everything from royalty and streaming to capital debt um, or equity debt structures uh, in terms of being able to advance this project forward. So, um, you know, uh, there, there's a lot of different opportunities out there. Um, some very, um, we'll say, uh, lower cost, but there's a higher, uh, you know, data requirement to achieve those financings. Um, versus uh, some higher cost debt that's a little bit uh, a little more flexible in terms of the terms, or uh, I should say higher cost financing. So we are exploring all opportunities and avenues. And uh, yes, uh, streaming royalty and or uh, equity slash debt structures are definitely being considered. Thank you. So Steve from Keith Godsmith, um, we have more gold question related. And he's asking, so would you consider hedging gold prices to futures and forwards if gold prices rise very favorably? Um, absolutely. Uh, the financial control side is uh, something that our uh, CFO is very comfortable with. And uh, when we get down to production and we look at a more um, intense, you know, capital structure and program, uh, I think that's absolutely something we will be bringing into our overall structure for sure. Yeah. And now uh, we have a more generic question. Uh, let's say compared to your competitors, there's lots of uh, gold mining, gold exploration companies out there. And why is your company outstanding compared to the others? 
<laughs> uh, first and foremost, I'd say it's our team. Uh, it's very rare to have a team of this caliber uh, with that level of experience that they do have uh, operating such a small and early stage company. Um, so we have global level brain power. And uh, as I've said, uh, the, the phrase of uh, hooking racehorses up to an apple cart. Um, it, it's absolutely fantastic to be working with people of this caliber. I learn far too much every single day that I work with my team. Um, secondly, uh, <laughs> instead of having to explore uh, through uh, what we'll call uh, the commonly phrased moose pasture, um, we're not just fumbling around in the dark. We have a past producing mine, um, again, with 74 veins identified on it and only seven have been exploited. Uh, this is a fantastic project to be working on, um, but plus it's in a fantastic jurisdiction. We are permitted for ore extraction right now, and we have a very friendly community relationship um, all of which are factors uh, which move us forward towards production and uh, what I consider to be great success. Thank you. Uh, also, we are, I'm pretty sure like many investors are wondering, uh, you know, like, let's say if, if they want to check, uh, if, if they want to see the short term, you know, the short term highlights that you com your company could accomplish, uh, what would they be? Uh, well, first and foremost, we're uh, working on our uh, community relations to wrap up the uh, the completion of our contracts both for us to be able to get a long-term um, contract for uh, exploitation number one uh, that gives us the surface rights to be able to do the work on site that we would need to uh, that will open up as i've described a uh, drilling program later this summer as well as uh, that will feed into both a resource estimate as well as a mine plan and a pea so with that in hand, you'll see that we are uh, going to be getting down to both bulk sampling and commercial production in the immediate term. Um, can't say too much more about other um, regional M&A, mm -hmm. but uh, definitely uh, several uh, data rooms are open and NDAs are signed. And uh, we're looking at uh, further growth in the same region as well as with further cash flow. So that, that's the most I can say right now. Okay. Um, now we have a question from Kemar Jones and he's asking, and. Uh, he was saying, as you mentioned, mentioned cash flow is critical. Absolutely. And he's saying, when are are we are we expecting to get to new chain production in Peru? Um, my estimate was uh, first and foremost, if I had to talk about revenue generation, uh, first estimate was uh, between Q3 and Q4. You'll start seeing some statistics about um, us uh, beginning with the wholesaling of product. Um, for the artisanal miners. Uh, so we'll see some cash flow start trickling in during that era. And uh, more like Q4 to Q2 of next year is uh, where the bulk sampling and the, um, uh, we'll say the ramp up from, from scale production on our own part, uh, but the commercial um, production ladder will start around then. So this is our, our rough timeline from now over the next, let's call it eight to 10 months. And we're talking a lot about Peru and it's actually a very uh, interesting question coming from Jackson. He's actually asking, how is the main jurisdiction in Peru? Um, it, it's very mining centric. It's very mining open, which is a fantastic place to be doing business. Um, there is absolutely, uh, since we've acquired this project, they have changed presidents twice. And there is a, uh, you know, commonplace saying that if they haven't changed presidents, um, you know, in the last 12 to 18 months, um, you know, it, it's due. Um, you know, and, and that's just over the last, you know, call it 10, 15 years in Peru. That's a commonality. Now, having said that, any, uh, in my opinion, and in the common uh, opinion that I hear uh, when I'm down there, is that um, for any administration to uh, affect the uh, mining industry in a negative fashion would be political suicide for them. And actually, very much to the converse, uh, the federal government has uh, very much um, sped up a lot of their internal processes. Uh, they've even created a, uh, they call it a unique digital window, whereas intent, instead of me having to ask for permit one going this way, uh, permission that, number two, um, you know, report number three, it's actually, everything's all in one database. Um, so you, it's like one portal that you get access to as the mining company, and you can go to seven or eight different uh, government uh, bodies all through that. So it's a, a massive streamlining process as well as asking for permits uh, that used to take up to two to three years to obtain. Now the average timeline is more like six months. So um, it's fantastic in terms of those opportunities. Plus, uh, you know, locally and, and domestically, uh, the people are very tuned to mining, even from a, you know, a, we'll call it a historical and even um, pre-Hispanic uh, perspective, uh, let alone in a modern context. Peru is one of the largest producers of uh, copper, gold, uh, you name it. It's a fantastic place to be. 
Okay, thank you. And now let's go for one last question because after we're gonna move to our second webinar. And second, but yeah, last but not the least from William Satleger. He's asking if the company is sufficiently capitalized to take the production up to the forecasted 200 ton per day. Um, at this point, at this exact juncture, uh, no. But um, we, like I had mentioned, we were working on different financing uh, programs and uh, we're getting great reception because of the, uh, the status of the actual project as well as the timeline to be able to produce. So with that in mind, um, I, I don't have any fears. I am a project finance uh, focused uh, professional, number one, and have an amazing team with an amazing project uh, and near-term cash flow generation uh, possibilities. So I, I find it uh, quite tangible in terms of where we're going and, and being able to source the financing we need to get to those levels, Willie. Thank you very much. Well, thanks a lot, James. It was a large question. Uh, thanks a lot for your very detailed presentation. We appreciate it. And for our viewers, see you guys for uh, at our upcoming webinar about NUSA. Thanks a lot for everything. Thank you so much, Mark.